by great pleasure to present Jorge Lopez Garcia here for this seminar. And um, she actually joined the laboratory Ecology Systematic Evolution at RC already in 2002. So she has a long and successful research uh, history in France. And um, in 2012, she got actually a ERC advanced grant, which is very prestigious for the project Protist World, which um, is um, which also involved then uh, uh, work on the Dalol site in Ethiopia. And I think we should surely, we should surely see some nice pictures from this very, very extreme area then here. Jorge is also associated member of the Royal Academy of Science in Belgium. And at the present, she is a researcher at CNRS. So welcome, Puri, for this uh, last seminar, which we have in 2022 for summer. We will go for the summer break and start again in September. Um, Puri, the floor is yours. Many thanks for coming again. And I am going now to mute myself. Okay, so thank you very much, Wolf. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to give this uh, talk on exploring the limits of life at extreme environments within this uh, European Astrobiology Institute uh, seminar series. Um, so as you said, I'm working on uh, diversity, ecology of evolution of microbes, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic at the Ecology Systematic Evolution Unit uh, here at Université Paris-Saclay, although I am myself working for the French uh, Research Council, the CNRS. So uh, I will in particular talk about uh, this exploration of the limits of life face to poly extreme environments in uh, this particular area, the geothermal field of the LOL, uh, which many people consider a Mars analog in particular because uh, it's highly saline and, in, and it contains also uh, um, uh, significant amounts of sulfates. Uh, and I will uh, divide my talk in two major parts. Uh, first, I will talk about it, the limits of life and life uh, in areas neighboring this geothermal field, phase two hyperacidic, sometimes hot, and hypersaline brines. And then I will uh, take the opportunity to discuss more about confounding factors for life detection, which in my view are uh, essential to interpret biosignatures correctly and not make uh, uh, claims that might be later uh, turn out uh, not quite accurate. Uh, but first of all, I have to thank uh, the team of people that uh, went with us in the film, uh, field. Uh, of course, this is a multi an interdisciplinary work involving people uh, in different areas of biology, geology, geochemistry, and crystallography. And of course, uh, we were followed by people who documented that and made a, a documentary. And uh, all of that would not have been possible without the help of the uh, Ethiopian army. Unfortunately, now the region is very difficult to access because of the war in the uh, neighboring Tigray. Uh, so this is a picture of the first expedition. We have done three different expeditions to this area. And uh, the work that I'm going to present is the joint work of several people, as I mentioned. I would like to start by presenting this schematic tree of life. This is just a sketch, but just to remind you that life uh, can be divided in three phylogenetic domains, uh, two prokaryotic domains, the bacteria and the archaea. They have simple morphologies. Uh, these triangles represent very large phyla with um, uh, many different members. And then we have the eukaryotic domains, with domain, which encompasses a wide diversity of morphological, uh, uh, di morphologically diverse organisms. We have multicellular lineages, we have the animals, the plants, the fungi, but we have essentially a wide diversity of uh, unicellular uh, uh, microbes uh, or protists. Um, 
Since the discovery by the 1970s, Archaea has have fascinated uh, researchers by their uh, particular adaptations to extreme environment. Not all Archaea thrive in extreme, what we call extreme environments, but many do, and they tend to hold records on stremophily. And actually, researchers over several decades have been studying the uh, limits of life and the records of extremophily for various microbes, mostly hold, uh, held by archaea, uh, faced to individual uh, physicochemical parameters. For instance, very high salt, and we have different types of halophilic archaea, haloarchaea, we'll call them, that can thrive up to salt saturation, sodium salt saturation, and also different types of salts. Uh, for instance, in these solar salters, you have alkaliphilic organisms thriving at high pH. You have acidophilic organisms. This is Rio Tinto for people who know that. Uh, with the record being held by Picrophilus oshimae, one are thermoacidophilic archaean uh, living at optimum pH of 0.7, but be able to thrive at a negative pH. And of course, hypothermophiles, which are these organisms that have fascinated the most scientists, they are able to grow optimally at temperatures higher than 80 degrees. And the record so far is held by Methanophilus candleri, growing up to a maximum temperature, depending on the pressure, of around 120 degrees Celsius. Um, however, uh, so we have been studying uh, individual physical chemical parameters, but much less is known about the limits of life faced to poly extreme environments, uh, sharing extreme values or ex uh, that we consider extreme for life uh, at the uh, boundary, for instance, of salinity, temperature, and pH. And I will be exploring these boundaries in this particular talk thanks to uh, precisely the poly-extreme geothermal field of Dalol. Uh, Dalol is located uh, in the Danakil Depression. Uh, here uh, is the depression, this is Dalol. Dalol is a proto-volcano, it's a hollow volcano, a salt volcano. It's not a real volcano because there is no lava emission, but there are fluids that are highly enriched in salt, brines, as we will see. Uh, the Danakil depression is below the sea level. Uh, actually, here the blue line corresponds to the sea level, and uh, the Danakil depression can go down up down to 150 uh, meters below the sea level. The whole area is tectonically very active. We have uh, here what uh, is known as the Afar Triangle. Uh, we have three main uh, tectonic plates, and this makes the region extremely active in terms of uh, seismic activity, seismic activity, volcanic activity, and of, of course, tectonic activity. So uh, we are uh, here uh, around the Ethiopian Rift, and in the future, uh, maybe there will be an ocean uh, happen, uh, opening up uh, here. Uh, so uh, because of that, there, are, there is a long range of volcanoes. There is the Erta Ale Ridge, which is uh, composed of active volcanoes. And uh, in the past, in the relatively recent past, uh, uh, the access to the Red Sea was blocked or was, uh, uh, yes, blocked by other volcanoes, in particular the Alip volcano and some lava emissions in the north. And this led to the progressive evaporation of the water that remained here. It is a very uh, hot area. Actually, uh, it, it has the record uh, annual mean uh, air temperature around 35 degrees. And these values were uh, published in the 60s, 1960s. So uh, with the climate change, it might be even hotter on average. Uh, and this means that uh, uh, Evaporation is very high, and the salts from the Red Sea uh, got uh, precipitated in, at the bottom of the depression, uh, leading to uh, the formation of a very thick layer of one to two kilometers of salt. The work that I'm going to present uh, uh, yeah, was carried out, as I mentioned, uh, after three field trips. Um, 
how does this uh, system work? Uh, Dalol, uh, as I said, is a protovolcano, not yet a volcano, uh, but it is a very active geothermal field with gas emissions. So um, the water infiltrates from the high plateaus that uh, and mountains actually that surround the depression. So uh, on the Ethiopian and Eritrean borders or sites, and the infiltrate they get. Uh, heated uh, by the presence of a magma chamber that is very close to the surface and then uh, these fluids traverse the thick uh, salt layer getting enriched in a variety of uh, salts depending on the specific uh, layers that they traverse and also the old sediments of the uh, uh, previous uh, red seed arm. Um, and so this leads to a series of uh, hydrothermal manifestations on top of the Dalol Dome, which looks like a crater, actually, it's a volcano, the, the surface of the crater, a salt crater collapsed some time ago. And then we have other reservoirs that are local specific characteristics, and we will see all of these. So here you have a top view of the Dalol Dome. It is relatively small, like five kilometers per three kilometers. Um, and you uh, have see here, you can see already some green, uh, yellowish spots, which correspond to an aerial view of uh, the, the active uh, hydrothermal systems on top of the Darrell Dome. So we have been working in several uh, sites at the dome and around the dome. Uh, this, uh, hydrothermal ponds on top of the dome. We have also been working in the salt canyons uh, on the west, southwest uh, part of the dome. Uh, we were camping, and this is our camping site. And we uh, also analyzed samples coming from the Black Lake, uh, which is here uh, north to this Black Mountain, and the Yellow Lake. Uh, we collected over these uh, three uh, years expeditions many different samples, several hundreds of samples from different sites. You have several of these labeled on these uh, uh, aerial views of the Dalol Dome, so the hydrothermal ponds that can be very changing according to the years, depending on the level of water, uh, uh, underground water actually. Uh, the Black Lake, north to the Black Mountain, the Yellow Lake, and uh, also as some kind of control uh, of uh, the Lake Asale or Lake Karung, which is a hypersaline lake uh, with hydrothermal uh, input. Uh, it's just to the north of the Ertal Range, and it has hydrothermal sources. Um, but it is less extreme than the sites on the north in the Dalol volcano. So some pictures to show you how these sites look uh, like. So here is the aspect of the Dalol hyperacidic and um, brines on top of the dome. Uh, uh, the pH of the emission as of, of fluids as it gets out of chimneys is around 800, 108 degrees Celsius, and the pH is very low, close to zero, but we never, we have never measured zero plus pH values. And then progressively, as the fluids become oxidized, they are anoxic when they get out, they are very hot, there's no oxygen there, they get progressively oxidized, and this corresponds to an, a, 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 a change in, in the color, so with darker uh, waters, there's a lot of iron that gets oxidized, and other metals too. Uh, but also, it, 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 it goes along a redox gradient, and we get uh, uh, even more negative pH values going down to minus 1.5 or even a bit uh, less, as you can see here in this uh, slide. Then we have uh, the Black Lake, which is south to the canyons that you see here on, in, in, on top of the, of, of the picture. It is a relatively small uh, uh, pond, I would say, that it's uh, pH around three, so not as acidic, 70 degrees Celsius on average, and a salinity that very largely uh, uh, the uh, overpass is 50%, uh, can be 70 or even 90% uh, uh, depending uh, on the year. Uh, we have also the Yellow Lake, Gaetale, uh, an acidic lake 
war warm, uh, 40, 43 degrees, and also extremely uh, hypersaline, more than 50%. Of course, um, this is a mixture uh, of salts. Uh, sodium chloride would be precipitated at these uh, concentrations, of weight volume, but we have a mixture of uh, uh, more soluble salts, notably magnesium and calcium salts. Um, there is active bubbling, degassing in the area, uh, and this can be particularly seen in this uh, uh, lake. Uh, and there is also a smell of organics. Actually, uh, chemical analysis have shown that uh, uh, of the gases that are uh, present in this system shows the presence of um, uh, CO2 and uh, uh, different types of hydrocarbons. And actually, these gases are, appear to be toxic. There are some dead animals around. And if you work for long hours, you need to wear some masks to protect yourself. On, other than that, we have also other systems that we have studied, in particular the salt plain at the base of the dome. Here you have the canyons on top Dalol, uh, of the Dalol system, the Dalol Mound. And uh, occasionally, uh, if there is water enough, the, the bottom of the depression gets wet and also uh, can be affected by geothermal activity. And you can tell that just by the yellow color that appear in some of these uh, little ponds. And actually, uh, to uh, this, uh, the presence of water at the, in the Danakil Depression can be documented over the years because now we have satellite data. And uh, you can observe here in this series of pictures, for instance, in this year, uh, that the whole depression was uh, filled with water and Dalol was an island. Actually, the Afar people recall that in the past, Dalol was called the Dalol Island. So. Uh, when uh, possibly referring to times where uh, usually there was more water in the depression. But um, because the, the bottom of the depression is very flat, uh, you very frequently observe the, the strong winds pushing uh, the waters of Lake Asale in the south towards the Lord. And this can be recorded by satellite images, but we have also witnessed that on site and the water can advance at several meters per, per, per minute or per a few seconds. And so you see these fingers of water pushing up to the north. And this reflects uh, the, the strong winds that are here in the region. And this is important uh, to take into account. So what do we have? We have different types of poly extreme environments with in general low pH temperatures that can be very high and salinity that is uh, very high sodium salt saturation, sodium chloride salt saturation, but also other types of salts. And so we have these gradients where to study the uh, uh, limits of life or the type or the diversity uh, of life thriving in these different places. So what we did uh, during these uh, studies was to collect samples uh, uh, from all these uh, systems uh, uh, along redox gradients and uh, along these physical chemical gradients and uh, do a series of analyses. Uh, of course, we analyze the chemistry of brines. By the way, in these pictures, you can see very well that when you let the fluids uh, uh, cool down, and then salt can precipitate and occupy, like this is the Yellow Lake, for instance, a big portion of the volume of a bottle, indicating that salts uh, are actually highly concentrated there. But other than chemistry, we also analyzed a wide uh, variety of other things, including um, microbial diversity by using cultural approaches, more uh, classical approaches, molecular approaches, trying to uh, uh, analyze uh, marker genes that are indicate, indicative of the, the phylogenetic diversity of the microbes present in these samples. Fluorescence activated flow cytometry and cell sorting, of course, microscopy, optical and electron microscopy, and uh, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy to characterize in particular the minerals associated to these systems. Um, our analysis showed that uh, uh, all the samples that we have collected uh, could classic, yeah, represented three major chemical zones. So this is a, a principal component analysis. And you can see that here we have a group of samples all in, in, in green uh, 
corresponding to the Dalol uh, dome brines, the hyperacidic brines, we have uh, which correlate very well with iron. They, they are very rich in iron, but also in, in other uh, uh, minerals. Uh, we have the yellow and black lakes that are highly enriched in uh, magnesium and calcium, very calotropic salts. So these type of salts are known for being high, highly hygroscopic, hygroscopic and uh, uh, having uh, a strong disorder in potential for micromolecules, biological micromolecules, so potentially deleterious for that for life in high concentrations. And then the environments that appear to be less extreme, they are hypersaline, they can be some, they're, yeah, but they, are, uh, they exhibit less uh, acidic waters in general, like uh, uh, the salt plain, uh, the uh, a reservoir uh, in a cave in the Dalol uh, canyons and the Lake Casale. Uh, and this, of course, uh, correlates well with pH, salinity, temperature, water activity. Okay. Um, so there are also important levels of organics, in particular in the Yellow Lake and the Dalol uh, uh, Dome ponds. So uh, we characterize the microbial diversity for a wide uh, um, a set of samples from these systems, uh, actually over 200. Uh, and here what we did was to purify the DNA directly from environmental samples, then amplify by PCR uh, uh, marker genes, uh, in particular 16S and 18S ribosomal RNA genes for prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And then uh, we either uh, did Sanger sequencing to have longer sequencing and uh, have better trees, but also we uh, sequenced these amplicons by high, using high throughput techniques and getting uh, millions of these sequences that then you can classify and place in a phylogenetic tree. Uh, and so what you place is operational taxonomic units, sets of sequences that are uh, very similar and that are a proxy for microbial species. Okay, so the results, what did we see? Uh, uh, we could amplify genes for uh, uh, mostly archaea and uh, bacteria, but in some cases also eukaryotes, in, uh, in the less uh, uh, poly-extreme places, uh, notably in Lake Casale, uh, the cave uh, brines uh, in the Dalol canyons, and then uh, the salt plain, but we never amplify uh, genes from uh, directly from the other samples, so many uh, dozens of samples. And here, what you already can see uh, is that most of these samples, here is the name of the samples, uh, were uh, highly enriched in different archaea, notably halobacteria, they are called halobacteria, but these are the classical haloarchaea, um, the name is historical, uh, and other archaeal groups, and bacteria were present but much less dominant. So those, this was the first result. However, um, uh, we tried to go further and then we made a nested PCR, uh, forcing the PCR conditions to try to amplify uh, genes, uh, these ribosomal RNA genes, also from other samples, in particular the Dalol dome and uh, the lake, uh, black and yellow lakes. Uh, in most of the samples, we got no results. However, in a subset of those samples, we could get amplicons that we uh, uh, then sent to sequencing. But the problem here is that we also amplified, uh, we apply these PCR conditions to the negative controls of the first PCR. And this was important because this negative control now gave positive results. And interestingly, uh, most of the sequences in the negative controls, meaning you make the PCR reaction with no DNA, just the negative control without DNA from the first PCR, then you see a lot of, uh, in particular, different types of bacteria. And these bars here in gray correspond to bacteria too. So 
the samples, uh, the diversity in these uh, uh, samples coming from the Dalol ponds and the Black and Yellow Lakes, which gave up amplicons, gave only or predominantly bacterial amplicons and, and the negative controls too. So this was suspect. And looking more into the type of bacteria that were associated, many were human associated. And then many are typical contaminants of biology kits that by now we know. Some people talk about chitons, and others were typically associated to dust, soil, or plant, and not necessarily characteristic of extreme environment. So to us, this suggested that these uh, amplicons might be contaminants during uh, sample, sample manipulation on site. We are not under sterile conditions, even if we take care of it, but also during laboratory uh, manipulation. It's something that is unavoidable when you have very low biomass uh, uh, environments. Uh, so our conclusion was that in most of these cases, we had most likely contaminants. And this was somehow reinforced by the idea that we could enrich uh, archaea and some bacteria from uh, the environments where we could very easily amplify those marker genes, but not from any of the Dalol uh, dome uh, samples, for instance. And furthermore, we also carried out some flow cytometry experiments. So for those of you who don't, don't really know the technique, what we do here is that you can pass cells or particles through a capillar, activate them with a laser, or uh, and activate their fluorescence if they have autofluorescence or the fluorescence of a DNA fluorescent dye, for instance, and then you can detect that fluorescence. And not only that, depending on the signal that you get, you can decide to sort the different particles or cells in uh, individual tubes or even individual cells. So we apply these two different types of samples, samples from the uh, salt plain and the cave uh, uh, on the upper part and samples from the Dalol dome. So the panels on the left indicate uh, actually the background. So this is the noise, uh, the fluorescence noise that is more or less the, the gray uh, bar here. And then you can add a DNA stain, a fluorescent DNA stain. This is what is shown on the right. When you have cells, usually the DNA gets stained, and then you see uh, the signal up uh, here above the background level. So you, you see an enhancement of a signal in these uh, red squares. And you can sort these cells, and actually you can check afterwards that these are uh, real cells under, this, in this case, the uh, scanning electron microscope. When you do that, uh, from samples from the dome or from the yellow lake, you don't actually see an enhancement of fluorescence. You seem to be at the level of background. But even that, uh, even in this case, you can decide to sort out these particles and you can observe them afterwards under the scanning electron microscope. And here you don't see cells, you see mineral precipitates. You, you see here halide crystals, but also other mineral precipitates that I will call biomorphs later, and this is important for the discussion. So we never observe real cells from this type of experiments after DNA staining from uh, the Dalol Dome or the Yellow or Black Lake. So this to us suggested that we didn't have uh, real cells thriving in those systems. However, in the systems where we can easily detect microbial uh, uh, diversity or microbial uh, organisms, we have an interesting diversity that is essentially dominated by halophilic archaea, mostly belonging to the halobacteria. So blue lines correspond to sequences from our study uh, obtained by Illumina methods, and the red dots correspond to Sanger sequences obtained from our, our study as well. And in black, you have reference sequences uh, uh, of different known archaea. So what you see is a wide diversity of halo uh, archaea, halo bacteria, and also nano halo archaeota, and then other types of archaea. 
Interestingly, uh, some of the OTUs, operational taxonomic unit species, if you wish, appear to be thermophiles or hypothermophiles. We have known for a long time that there is a more or less linear correlation between the GC content in ribosomal RNA genes and the uh, optimum growth temperature of the different microbes. So the uh, blue triangles correspond to culture microbes, which are known uh, and can be cultivated at optimal temperatures in the lab. And uh, in the Danakil OTUs distribute here along this line, and you see that some of them correspond or fit or uh, fall in this area of hyperthermophilic microbes, organisms that grow at more than 80 uh, uh, degrees Celsius optimum. So there are some organisms that appear to be halophilic and hypothermophilic at the same time. So these results suggested that we have the unequivocal presence of life only in the Asale Lake, the cave water and, and the salt plain here in these samples, but not in the Dalol Dome or in the black and yellow lakes. Uh, in the last uh, field trip that we did to the area, our, and this is uh, uh, actually compatible with uh, things that we know from other studies, that tau tropicity, so high uh, calcium, magnesium, salt, uh, and this organ with this organizing potential, also lithium is highly tautropic. Um, uh, uh, are not compatible with life and very low water activity is not compatible with life. Okay. Uh, so in our last uh, expedition, we were able to detect and sample other systems that appear to be close uh, or closer to this boundary, defining regions with clear life from regions with <laughs> no life, uh, uh, apparently. And uh, these systems, we call them Western Canyon Lakes that are located to the west of the Dalol Dome. Uh, we sampled five of them. This is a, a helicopter view. And these lakes are somewhat similar to the Yellow Lake in the sense that they are uh, degassing, they are organic. So it smells uh, <laughs> very nastily as well. Uh, the pH is slightly acidic. Um, it's also a hypersaline, and the water activity is actually rather low, although apparently permissive on its own. And we were actually able to amplify uh, uh, 16S ribosomal RNA genes, much less uh, uh, 18S ribosomal RNA genes. Uh, and uh, the main result here is that these systems were uh, much more enriched in archaea, actually up to 99%. So this is actually uh, witnessing the uh, uh, ex extremophily of these sites or the extremophilicity of these sites as compared to other very extreme places such as the samples that we analyzed in our previous study. Red colors correspond to different archaeal groups here. So dominated by haloarchaea, but also with a large proportion of nanohaloarchaeota, which are uh, in general, epibionts, uh, most likely of this halobacteriota. Okay, we have now metagenomes of these systems uh, and we have, of course, studied them. And one of the things that is very classically known and we observe in this system is some genomic adaptation to hyperallophily. Namely, we can detect that on average, the proteins of these microbes are acidic, are much more acidic than those of other systems. So here, in most ecosystems, you have a bimodal distribution. So these are PI value, uh, uh, isoelectric point, and this is the, uh, the percentage of sequences that have these values. Uh, so in fresh water or sea water, you have a bimodal distribution. In high, in, in uh, solar salt and at saturation, you have this type of values. And in this uh, Dalol metagenome, or not Dalol, Dalol area metagenomes, uh, we have uh, even more uh, marked uh, signs of hyperallophily. We, of course, have also uh, reconstructed uh, um, genomes or assemble genomes from metagenomes so that allows you to study individual lineages of or species from uh, these mixed metagenomes. Metagenome is an environmental genome. You sequence all the DNA that is present in a sample. And actually some of them reveal new groups of archaea 
in particular, we are studying uh, two new groups, one that we call the Asboarchia, Asbo means salt in Afar, and then the Afar Archaeota, that appear to be basal to uh, the classical Haloarchaea. So that is the first part of my talk, and now I would like to talk more about confounding factors for life detection at, at habitability borders. At cases like this one in Dalol, where we have, in principle, in more extreme environments at the boundary of life, you have very low biomass because we are really at the boundaries of uh, these physical chemical limits of life. And here, you need to be very careful because, for instance, among other things, contamination can be a serious issue in these low biomass environments. So, um, I'm going to use this example that some of you know, uh, a study that was published in 2019 by Gomez and co-workers who went to this site and sampled two uh, different, uh, so presented uh, results from two different samples, a chitney uh, that they call D9, close to the uh, high, uh, an acidic, uh, hyperacidic uh, pond D9, uh, D10, sorry, um, and they uh, were able to obtain uh, a sequence, a single OTU uh, belonging to the group of nanohaloarchaeota, that is this Dalon 9 here, from this salt chimney, but not from the pond. They never uh, got applicants from the, this brine. Um, however, um, uh, and they did some fish experiments, and I will come to this uh, later. Um, uh, because we had done uh, contamination controls, and we knew that there were uh, that, that this could be an issue, uh, we tend to interpret this as a potential contaminant for from the salt plane. As I mentioned, contamination here can be a problem, for instance, associated to aerosols or human associated. Human associated, why? The LOL is very small, as I said, three per five kilometers. It was a highly touristic place until the world integrate uh, um, uh, uh, started. And this is just a view of uh, from the dome to the salt plain. Um, at around 10 in the morning, when all the tourists come, they stay there for a couple of hours, take pictures, and then go home. And so they climb to the dome. There can be many, and they uh, can do weird things with the salt, etc. And so they can transport in their shoes, for instance, uh, different things from the uh, salt plane. And some uh, tourists do even this kind of not very commendable things, but okay, it's the risk. Uh, but not only that, uh, there is also a natural source of potential contamination, which is the wind and the dust transported by the wind. The lol is very close to the mountains and there are strong winds in the area. So in 2016, there had been rain just before we arrived and everything was clean. So this is the chocolate formation. You can see how brilliant this is, these surfaces are. One year later, the same formation was completely covered by a relatively thick uh, co uh, cover of, of dust. And so we wonder, can this be a source of external contamination? And actually it is. In our last uh, trip, what we did was to expose different filters on the dome and also on the uh, in the campsite, here for one week, here for two weeks, and then we analyzed the diversity that was uh, collected in the filters. Um, uh, after just one or two weeks of exposure to the normal air. And uh, for comparison, I have put here the diversity that we uh, observe in different environments around the Dalol Dome, and here the diversity that was captured with the aerosols. You can see just by the colors that whereas in the poly-extreme areas around the, the Dalol Dome, you have samples that are largely enriched in archaea, they are living there. These samples are enriching bacteria, different groups, notably groups that are typically associated to soil. 
uh, so they uh, most of the uh, so these aerosols transport dust particles mostly coming from the surrounding plateaus but there are also a few sequences of archaea and among those sequences you find nano archaeota and halobacteriota by the way the the yellow points are samples that have been detected in these aerosols and here in red is the sequence from uh, this study by Gomez and co-workers, which is uh, in the middle of practically identical sequences coming from the, Dalol, uh, the, the salt plain and uh, Lake Asale. So this strongly suggests that this type of organisms are transported by uh, the wind and by the dust, at the very least, and also maybe by the shoes of many tourists, to the dome. Okay, and this get can get stick onto the walls of chimneys that are not necessarily wet. But then we ask a question: If in just one week we detect with no problem at all, no need for nested PCR, if we detect lots of different types of microbes, why don't we detect them in the hollow, uh, in the Dalol brines? And actually. The response or the answer is that because these hyperacidic brines quickly degrade DNA and cells. And to demonstrate that, what we did, what we did was uh, to carry out some experiments. We took a uh, dalol brine, in particular this, uh, um, this brine here, uh, and we did also the experiments, but here I'm showing this uh, in this picture. And one of the things that we did was to incubate uh, for different uh, amounts of time uh, bright, uh, cultures of Escherichia coli, so a bacterium, Halobacterium salinarum, which is an archaeon adapted to this type of environments, and PS, so microorganisms typic, uh, growing in the uh, in brines from the salt plains, so autochthonous microorganisms. And we incubated them with this brine, and uh, uh, very rapidly, uh, after less than five minutes, you uh, the DNA concentration in these uh, 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 cultures uh, this uh, goes down to background levels, the gray bar. Furthermore, you cannot amplify 16S ribosomal RNA after just immediate contact. Everything appears degraded. You amplify that in the control, but not in the incubations. And you can also see that at the cellular level, these are, are some natural samples from the uh, from the uh, cave reservoir, uh, and this is from Lake Asale. All the dots are cells stained by uh, a DNA uh, fluorescent stain. Uh, before and immediately after contact with this particular brine time zero so upon seconds of contact all the cells are destroyed okay so this strongly suggests that the brines are not only not harboring life but they destroy the life that is coming uh, from aerosols and dust um so Despite so, uh, in this particular study, um, and despite the fact that some uh, DNA, uh, ribosomal RNA genes were not um, amplified from this sample D10, Gomez and co-workers carried out some fluorescent in situ hybridization experiments uh, using a, a probe that is specific to nano haloarchaea. And in green, you can see what they claim to be cells stained by uh, DNA fluorescent dye. Um, so um, they claimed in this uh, type of observations that these little dots were cells and that, that they were ultra small cells. And actually, yes, there are ultra small cells around the LOL in the systems where we do amplify ribosomal RNA genes without any problem. And you can see these cells here, different shapes, uh, uh, under uh, scanning electron microscopy here, here, some of them are really very small, uh, two, three hundred nanometers in diameter, so different shapes. But you also see in many of these samples, and this is something that we had already observed at the beginning, things that look very much like cells but are not cells. In particular, these are real cells and these are samples from this particular brain that we use. Uh, from the Dalol Dome that look very much alike, but they are made of minerals. In particular, they are enriched in silicon uh, and sulfur here. Uh, 
Um, so these are what we call biomorphs. Uh, abiotic mineral precipitates that look like cells but are not cells. And actually, they are very diverse in this type of brines, those that contain cells and the ones that do not contain cells. So you have real cells, that these are the arrows, but you have also rounded things that are enriched in particular silica, but they can also have magnesium here or uh, sulfur in particular as well. So we, uh, we were already aware that uh, these type of biomorphs existing in these places can be uh, confounding factors and that simple morphological biosignatures cannot be accepted without any type of questioning in these kind of systems. So we need to combine more biosignatures or more evidence before concluding about the biological origin. Now, in that study that I was pre mentioning previously, some of these uh, uh, forms rounded simple morphological uh, uh, structures were taken as fossilized microbes. However, we know that Dalol is a natural laboratory of crystallization. This happens at macro scale. You have many different wonderful uh, and beautiful shapes and forms. Uh, of different types of salts and, 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 and minerals. You have either, even these wonderful balls that are forming spheres uh, somehow. But this happens also at micro and nano scale. And so is, is it safe to consider that these are fossilized microbes or are these just abiotic biomorphs? So that can be questioned. And second, and, and then this leads me to a previous observation. During the, the, the study that I mentioned uh, that we carried out using fluorescence activated cell sorting, we had already realized that some uh, mineral particles um, absorb DNA dyes. And you could even sort these particles based on this fluorescence. So the next question was, is there any spe unspecific, non-specific binding of DNA dyes and oligonucleotide probes to biomorphs? So in order to test for this, we repeated the same type of experiments that Comet et al. Uh, uh, did using the same uh, DNA dye, cybergold, and the same probe labeled in the same way with uh, CY3 uh, uh, probe. Um, and under the same conditions, but this time using controls, which are supposed to be used in all kinds of fish experiments. And so when you do these incubations, but you have no probe at all, and you have the DNA dye, etc., you see in Dalol brines, so these experiments with Dalol brines, where and don't harbor necessarily cells, you see that there, are, there is a signal, but this is uh, autofluorescence possibly coming from minerals. Uh, and another control that we use is to use a, a probe that does not match the target organism. This is a very general probe used uh, in uh, fish experiments as control. And again, you see some autofluorescence, but this is not specific. Okay, and then you see, of course, fluorescence with this probe, but you see forms that do not actually match uh, those of cells. So you can question whether this is a specific signal indicating the presence of nanohaloarchaeota. Now, when you use samples that do contain cells, including uh, haloarchaea and nanohaloarchaeota, this is the case of samples from the salt plain, you do see, uh, in particular here down, that the probe specific for nanohaloarchaeota uh, targets lo uh, lots of tiny cells that are around surrounding other cells, likely haloarchaea. But this uh, binding is not specific because when you do not add the probe and under the same condition, you still see this signal. So actually, this type of experiment is not conclusive because it's not specific. And there is unspecific binding both of DNA dyes and of this particular probe onto minerals. So in conclusion, what we can say is that with the data that we have, we have found limits of life in the Dalol system. There is no liquid water, there is no life, either in the black or yellow lakes, which are highly caotropic, 
but there's no life either in the uh, Dalol or no proof for life so far, con convincing proof for uh, life in the Dalol hyperacidic and hypersaline brines. It is a place where tautropicity is also very high and possibly there's a mixture of combinations that make this the place uh, not actually permissive for life. So we have a place on Earth, on the surface of Earth, when there is no where where there is no life in the presence of liquid water and of course this has implications for habitability on earth and also elsewhere and the second very important message that i want to pass here is that in order uh, in this kind of environments where you are at the boundaries at the physical bound, uh, chemical boundaries of life in in order to claim that there is life you need to use all kinds of controls, the null hypothesis should be that there is no life and you need to prove the contrary with significant evidence or consistent evidence. And you always need to consider and test alternative hypotheses or explanations. For instance, in this particular case, that uh, DNA dyes bind non-specifically to mineral biomass that are forming in situ. And with that, I think that I am done. I just want to thank the team uh, that went with us to the to the field. This is a picture from the Earth Alley, and in particular, Karim Ben Serrara, who did all the uh, mineralogy analysis, David Moreira, Chema Lopez, and Jolie Belilla, who uh, was my PhD student and did uh, part of it, part of this analysis. And thank you very much for your attention. Questions, welcome. Yeah, ah, well, pretty very nice presentation for showing uh, to many of us how we have to perform experiments to find life. Our, my question is only related to some of the of the, the experiments you show. You will agree that if you can demonstrate that there is a DNA inside of the water of the Dalol uh, uh, system, uh, this will be a solid proof of life. No, I say that uh, it, that DNA alone is not necessarily a proof in the sense that you can also have extracellular DNA a lot, but not in this Dalol system. Highly acidic uh, pH uh, degrades the purinates DNA. So uh, yeah, if you want to eliminate DNA from anywhere, you just treat it with uh, hydrochloric acid and you clean it all. So DNA per se is not a witness of active life. It can be a witness of a previous life that lies in the left DNA traces. But so I, uh, what I say here is that you need convergent evidence that is additive and that is consistent. So DNA, but also cells that we uh, that are clearly shown, eventually cultures, but cultures growing under the right uh conditions that is conditions that mimic the local conditions so you cannot sample surface uh, salts and then uh, uh incubate those salts for instance as some people have done um uh, for studying so to speak methanogens under uh salt conditions that are very far away from those in the local conditions because then you could have contaminants coming from the environment from the lab environment or others uh, and and that is not a proof of life under these polystream conditions so that is uh, something very important but if you have a culture of organisms living at ph zero salinity 50 percent or 40 percent and more or less high temperature yes then you would have a proof of life i haven't seen this in the case of that i would be happy to see that Okay, 